widely considered Destiny 1's best year, The Taken King was the DLC, as described by Luke Smith and Mark Noseworthy, a quote, pivotal moment for the game. This DLC was massive, and even by today's standard of Destiny seasonal model, the Taken King proved to have a whole year of innovations for the game, whereas Destiny's first year could be seen as the great experiment. Filled with bumps, crunch, bad business, and beneath it all, beauty. The Taken King looked to innovate and break new ground for what an FPS looter shooter could come up with. This was uncharted water, but longtime World of Warcraft veteran Luke Smith was very familiar with the elements that made the greatest MMO of all time work. Deemed Scarab Lord in World of Warcraft, Smith would lead the direction and vision for the Destiny player base's story. And who better to face in the Taken King than the father of a raid boss to an already iconic villain? So today, we look back at the Taken King eight years later. Some footage in this video is from players around the community. Their links will be in the description of this video, as well as the music too. In celebration of the Taken King eight years later, and the anniversary being today, I wanted to promote something pretty special. Right now, if you go to my merch store, evanf.store, you can check out the brand new Raid That Never Happened design. This is a design where Oryx and Crota are a part of the same raid encounter one that Luke Smith notoriously said was not in the game, but was a part of the original vision. There's also Crota the Hive Prince of the Oversold designs in white and black as well. If you wanted to pick up a print or a piece of merch right now, you can head to my store and use promo code WORLD to get free shipping worldwide. Enjoy the rest of the video. The year was 2015, May of 2015. Skolas was still terrorizing every player in the Prison of Elders, and Galahorn was the distinguished ultimate weapon for Destiny. On May 6th of 2015, Bungie files for the trademark The Taken King, with the logo resembling the Hive symbol in the Grimoire. We jump forward to May 29th, and Bungie announces that they are working with Activision first-party developer High Moon Studios. Known for... Deadpool? and Transformers. This would be the start of the relationship for these two, as High Moon would be in charge of multiple projects in Destiny 2. But for now, they were new to working with Bungie. While those two announcements were electric, it's also important to this story that you know another trademark name was filed for Bungie. Leave me a comment if you know. The name sending shivers down every player's spine. Eververse. Little was known about the Eververse Trading Company, but at the time, the name Trading Company would imply that you could exchange your god rolls with other players. Little did we all know what this actually meant. The month of June was now in full swing, and if you played games back then, it was like Christmas seeing that E3 logo. E3 may not be the powerhouse it once was. In fact, it's all but dead. But back then, every single developer wanted to be on that stage and every gamer would fight to be in that crowd. On June 17th, the rumors of the Taken King were proven true, as Bungie, Activision, and gamers collectively clapped their hands together for the banger on the horizon. His name is Oryx, the Taken King. And he's coming for you, Guardian. The day of Oryx's arrival broke all of the charts for Destiny trailer viewership. 
the day the Taken King came to fruition was the day that Skolas was nerfed and put in place, bowing down to the eventual king. A press tour of new innovations for Destiny, week after week after week after week, all focused on what the DLC had in store for players. First, the Collector's Edition with its own trinkets and a look at a potential new type of weapon as an exotic on the cover. I actually own this edition and it's pretty cool. There's all sorts of lore in it. I don't know if you... Everything just fell out. It's pretty cool, but there's a bunch of lore in it. There's all this kinds of like, you know, designer art early sketches. And uh, if I can find it, there should be a strange coin in here too. Where did that go? Surely I can find it. What am I, what am I doing? This is crazy. Wait, is this Halo Reach stuff? Is this even Destiny? <laughs> is this even Destiny? No, this is Halo stuff. What the fuck am I doing? What is happening? Am I in an illusion? This is Destiny. This is like early sketches and stuff of, of the Dreadnought. This is Destiny. I, I know this is Destiny. What is this? Oh, I've never opened this before. Look at that. That's Sleeper Simulant. Okay. All right, let me go find that. Um, okay, I found the book. But the big problem is that I don't know where the fuck the strange coin went. If you guys can see that, there are coordinates telling you where to go in game to go put in a code that you would find. And there's all kinds of cool stuff. Like all the new exotics are in here. Like Telesto's right there. Probably gonna break the game. But yeah, it's really cool. And I'm out of a strange coin. Then on July 30th, shortly after Gallahorn Day, which was my birthday, the Dreadnought was shown to the world. As lead artist Andrew Hopps said in his post, quote, It was important to us that you would feel the scale as you moved through the hulls of the Dreadnought, never sure about what to expect as large spaces condensed to claustrophobic tunnels before revealing entirely new areas of the ship. A sense of wonder about the unknown is what drove a lot of the spatial design. It was an incredibly fun challenge to find the right balance between a mysterious tomb ship and the flagship for the Taken fleet, to capture the idea of this unfathomable threat, a monstrous spaceship captained by the Taken King, yet filled with vast caverns and unknown passages. If you played the Taken King, you know this was a spot-on description of the location, and the concept art mostly matched the in-game look. It was about as well of a job modern day consoles could handle. Before we get ahead of ourselves, we still have a press tour. Stars. I was a guardian. I stood against the darkness. My eyes saw hope and a future full of light. Six of you went down into the pit. You sought revenge for those I lost. You slew a god. Grota. With his last breath, he reached out across the night. And now, the night has answered. Kota's father. He smells the blood of his son on your hands. The promos were all focused on Oryx getting revenge for Crota, while the lore and story focused on Oryx the Great Explorer and the Conqueror. Trailers like this highlighted that perfectly. We have murdered his son. And now the Taken King comes for us all. 
Also released on August 5th was interviews for 100 questions about the Taken King, with some great questions and some really odd ones with defiant dartboard theory. Do you know what's inside the Traveler? I do. Is every Guardian required to take dancing lessons? Sort of. Can you skip cutscenes? Yes. Can you skip the shooting? Hold sprint. Can you skip the expansion? Not recommended. Is the Traveler secretly evil? In time, we'll discuss more. The press tour wasn't all received well, however, because with sweeping changes to the game came a word every Destiny player is now very familiar with. Sunsetting. Sunsetting was a word not nearly as contained back in 2015, but that doesn't mean it was received all that well either. Fans were pretty unhappy with the idea, but I think Matt Miller of Game Informer summed this up perfectly by saying, Initial reaction to Destiny's plans for old legendary gear for many long-time players will be sadness. As someone who is going to miss my vision of confluence, I share in the pain. However, I was lucky enough to get to experiment with many of the new weapons on offer in The Taken King, and many of the new weapons offer genuinely novel shooting experiences. While part of me enjoyed the chance to bring some of my old standbys into the recent House of Wolves expansion, I found after several weeks that I was uninterested in many of the new weapons, since few were as comfortable to shoot as existing favorites, particularly some of the older raid weapons. I'm excited to try out new options in the coming year, even if I'll always have a special place in my heart for Fatebringer and its cousins. Destiny has always had a sunsetting issue versus most MMOs, whereas most MMOs are built on the idea of abilities and stats coming together to make wiping out a room of enemies easy, Destiny is built on weapon principles that, if broken, can result in feeling like not reaching the same heights, the reoccurring problem for this live service game. Luke Smith was quick to reassure fans that, quote, I definitely feel like some of our players are ready to play with some new toys, and we've built a whole bunch of new toys. There are definitely some weapons that you're going to find better versions of. There's going to be something that replaces that sniper rifle that you love. Bungie had all legendary armor and weapons sunset to stay at year one's level. And for the exotics, only some move forward into year two versions. With even the most iconic of all, Queen Breaker's bow. Okay, yeah, it's not the most iconic. I still like it. Gallahorn staying behind. The negative press tour didn't stop at sunsetting. However you feel now, back then, changing Peter Dinklage from Nolan North as the ghost was seen one way or another. Some people felt Dinklage didn't get a fair shake and was dealt a tough hand, while others loved Nolan North's more upbeat attitude for the role. The other bad press surrounded the leveling changes, now offering infusion on a seemingly random calculation, and having to grind for new levels in general. The real kick in the teeth was to Xbox players who would learn that yet again Destiny was going to have exclusives only found on PlayStation. A whole strike, PvP map, and an armor set exclusive. Just to pour salt in the wound, hand cannons were set to be nerfed right along the big release of the long-awaited, contractually obligated Hawkmoon. Even with all great things, there are some negatives to paint. September was approaching quickly, but that only meant gameplay was to be shown off. Along with eight total Crucible maps and the changes to competitive multiplayer, Game Informer got to go hands-on with the game, showing off the soon-to-be exotic called Sleeper Simulant. The time was coming, and you could just feel the stars were aligning for Bungie, High Moon Studios, Activision, and of course, all of us. I remember. Oryx the Taken King is synonymous with the composers Michael Salvatore, C. Paul Johnson, and Sky Lewin, who made this sound that always stands out to me. It's so iconic that every time I hear anything even similar, I think back to the Taken King. It's brilliant, and the mission begins after this incredible cinematic.
You and I know how this ends. We've known since you escaped from that pit. Guide them, my hidden friend. It is all up to you now. Phobos is in danger, and the once thought powerful Cabal have lost in a brutal way. It's crazy to think that our enemy has been decimated by something even alien to them. Explosions, set pieces, limping Cabal. This was a tone setter of losing early and establishing Oryx as the ultimate threat for destiny. As I IGN walked into the base, the tone got established. Thank you for your input, Eris. Already in the first mission, we are seeing the Taken, how Oryx takes, and the stakes raised even higher than Destiny has ever been. You fight Cyrock, the Word of Oryx, a Taken Knight. Hive Knights normally shot Arc Blasters, but the Taken version uses Solar, an idea that would be spread across all Taken, new abilities. After the exploration of the base, it becomes quickly overrun with Taken, and the goal is to escape. One brand new addition to the Taken King was scannable lore through missions, and while it was only extras, it added to the scale of the world without taking away from the story at hand. The rest of the mission yelled at me to get on my ship, or I would be toast. But I was uh, very underleveled in this footage, and I just walked over. In hindsight, it would have been nice for this mission to be timed to get me out by the end, or if I can't get out by the end, I fail. Either way, I eventually made it to my ship, and I left Phobos. Zavala, we made it to our ship. We're heading home. I always loved how the Taken bowed to Oryx in this scene, while looking so possessed. And that night in the cutscene that speaks perfect English is the first boss of Ghosts of the Deep's dungeon named Ekthar. The Vanguard meet, and this is when Cade gives his most infamous line in Destiny 1. Eris, get your rock off my map. Eris says something that always stuck with me, but was never explored further after this DLC. Whatever you kill, Oryx will take. I always wanted an encounter where we started fighting Hive or Fallen. Then all of a sudden, all the bodies get taken and we're propelled into a harder fight. The Raid King's Fall does have a little bit of this, but honestly, I wish this was pushed further. Mission 2 has us going to a new portion of the Cosmodrome, and this time, we're searching for Cade's stash. Bungie knew that if we were to return to familiar locations, they would need to up the stakes, and Cade's stash does that and then some. This was also the mission that my new character, Underleveled, couldn't beat, so I came back after an hour of bashing my head against the wall trying to get through the first area. On this second attempt, I brought a Destiny 1 classic to the fight. And for the rest of the campaign, 
with Red Death. In this mission, you pass a dead Sepix Prime and take an elevator to the top of the Cosmodrome. It's here where I discovered that the game added wind physics for me being up this high. Something beyond light would shamelessly steal six years later. After trekking through the tower and high scale platforming, this memorable phalanx pays a visit, but this time he didn't get me. As I headed up, I remembered there was a secret stash separate from the secret stash in the mission, but I couldn't remember where it was. So I spent over an hour running in circles until I finally found it. secret rooms good times help yourself to the glimmer but leave the exotics for me when i get out of this tower <laughs> a jack of spades yeah i had a whole system to keep track of things the royal cards stood for weapons spades meant hockey clubs for crux lomar diamonds for amalan and hearts <laughs> well hearts were for this girl i knew what was her name uh, don't you have a stealth drive to find? After a fight with an Echo of Oryx, which was the first time fighting it, but far from the last, Cade reveals the final stash. And if you pull your ghost and scan the pod, it's an Easter egg to motherfucking Master Chief. Pod number 10201. A guardian with exceptional light sealed himself inside. He's been in there for centuries. Before I found you, I tried to resurrect him, but he preferred to sleep. He said the last war was enough for a thousand lifetimes. There it is. The best hiding places are always in plain sight. Transmit it out of there. I'll get it set up. Just do me a favor. If you find anything else I've hidden, leave it for me. There'll be treasure enough for everyone on the Dreadnought. Now that we have the cloaking tech from Cade's stash, we can bring it to the Dreadnought. A place so powerful, one blast took out an entire Awoken fleet. The Dreadnought is Destiny 1's best location, and probably the best or second best depending on who you ask, other than the Dreaming City. Right from the get-go, you get blasted with the scale of this ship. The ship was also the first time a location had a mechanic to get around, and this introduced hidden platforms that could only be seen with your ghost. This mission was simple. Explore the Dreadnought and establish a link to be able to patrol it in the future. This had more taken, but by the end you realize that this isn't just a war for us. It's a Cabal fight too, as the ghost tells us. Cabal ship? Skyburner's cars. Must have deployed from Phobos. Cabal? We'll deal with them later. Defeat the tank and get out. Establishing a link also brought you to the new supers in the game. We're talking Sunbreaker Titan, Stormcaller Warlock, and Night Stalker Hunter. Each had their own cutscene and each had their own sets of missions that all felt uniquely different from another. It was something that I really appreciated on a second playthrough, and something that I kind of glossed over on my first time around. These subclasses themselves have always been the most memorable for each class in Destiny 1, other than self-res warlocks, and that's because of reasons we'll get to in a little bit. But the short version is that Titan's good in PvP and Melting Point great for bosses. Hunter Shade Step and Tether OP, and Warlock absolutely bonkers ad clear. What assisted the journey of these was the Taken King's exotic class items for the Ultimate Edition owners. With these, you got a 25% XP boost to your subclass as you leveled it. And don't forget, you had to level everything in Destiny 1. Weapons for the perks, armor for the perks, and subclasses for the skill tree perks. The only other exotic class items in the game were a grind. And from Dead Orbit, New Monarchy, and Future War Cult at level 25 of each of them but we'll talk about those later. Back to the missions. Enemy of My Enemy is probably the least memorable mission of the Taken King, simply because it doesn't have any cutscenes or major boss fights. The quick version is that you need to learn the Cabal's intel and activate Thrall statues to reach Oryx in his throne room, but you're interrupted when you try to enter by another shade of Oryx. 
The one very memorable piece was seeing a large centurion get tossed into a portal like a little baby by Oryx in the Taken, which would lead into the Bond Brothers strike as they were seeking out revenge for their lost brother. The Bond Brothers strike, like all the Taken King strikes, was so creative and ambitious compared to the notable formula for Destiny. It's not too off the script, but working within Destiny's capabilities, the Bond Brothers were Ornstein and Smo for Destiny 1. One of them shot long range like a Blastoise, and the other one was close with his Maulers like a Charizard. You could cheese the first brother just by crouching, but I didn't know that when I first started playing the Taken King. So when both of them entered the final phase, it was hell on earth to get away. Once I beat the bricks off of these two for a rare chance, I got the Maul's Maulers. Titan gauntlets that just looked amazing. Taken King would do a lot for the core of the game. After that strike, the campaign continued on. But this time, you had to grab a fragment of Crota that remained on the moon. The great battle fought for the soul of our world ended in slaughter. The sun was dead. And we invited the wrath of Oryx, destroyer of light, taker of will. Only Ascendant Hive move between ruptures. To reach Oryx, you must walk in the dying footsteps of his son. You must become Ascendant. This mission is mostly retreading explored ground, but Tolan made the first appearance here. Pass through its deepest layers. Our light would be as a dying sun. I don't think Tolan was much fun at parties. You could tell that this was the era when the story embraced not taking itself too seriously with delving into the difficult to understand lore. It wasn't self-indulgent, but for some reason, someone at Bungie really liked making fun of Tolan and Eris. After fighting the ogre named Bax and stealing a fragment of Crota, Eris delivers one more of those memorable silly lines. It's gone. Oryx just took an ogre. Not even Oryx can control an ogre, unless it's taken. Now quickly, I need a shard of that crystal. Eris, you have the eyes and the knowledge of the hive, and you still say that. You escape the taken onslaught and head towards the exit using relics to open the doors, instead of the destiny trope of just defending a door while the ghost protects you. One thing I found interesting in a run back of the mission was scanning this door. The Fallen left their dirty fingerprints all over this door. What were they doing here? They just missed the was this the hint for the Black Spindle mission? On a daily heroic version of this mission, the door was wide open and the timer began for a taken version of the Tannic Strike. The Black Spindle was the reward at the end, and I have already made a video on this so I won't go too deep into it, but it was incredible, and made every single Destiny player check every crack in the game for more. And trust me, with the Taken King, there was a lot more. After the Lost to Light mission, Cade tells us we need to get an upgraded stealth drive if we want to execute a master plan, so we need to go to the Cosmodrome and get access to Rasputin. The mission Promethean Code has us going to a portion of Rasputin, going backwards through the Saber Strike, and hacking the codes against Taken armies. Speaking of trekking back through Saber, this was also a new strike introduced in the Taken King, and a damn good one too. Now take all of the missions we've done so far, and think about how all of them combined do not hold a candle to the final two. Last Rites is the funeral. Oh, oh. Okay, you've got the crystal. All you have to do now is fill it with Crota's soul. The hive are in the middle of some kind of funeral, so... Not a funeral. Not a funeral. My bad, Eris. Right. So when you get to this funeral, Oryx will be watching close. Use Rasputin's cloak to slip past the Taken. Find Crota's soul, wrap it up, and get out. Okay, so it is a funeral of Crota. And this is in the throne room of the Crota Zen Raid. This was the only time I can remember stealth being used in a mission for Destiny with a pretty great way of doing it. If you get caught, you're constantly taking damage while being surrounded by Taken, and eventually dying. 
I wanted to be able to hear the environment while sneaking, but someone at Bungie blasted my ears with the ogre footsteps. I know Oppenheimer just came out, but Bungie was promoting it early here. After making comically loud sounds opening the door, I think they heard that. We sneaked to Crota's rock to try and pair the essence we took from our trip to the moon to gain access to Oryx. You see the daughters of Oryx and a bunch of familiar knights from Crota's end raid. Once you do grab the essence, your cover is blown, and this becomes an all-out assault from the Taken, ending with the Taken Ogre and Centurion coming to fight you, and Eris casting spells. Guardian, come on with me. Now that that mission is over, ladies and gentlemen, we are on to the final one. And I need you to please rise for our national anthem. The grand finale the final showdown with Oryx. Take the portal and journey to the founts at the belly of the Dreadnought. This area will look very familiar if you played the Sunless Cell Strike, another creative and fantastic strike for Destiny featuring Alakul the Dark Blade. This one was a key component and finale for another great quest in the Taken King, but we'll talk more on this strike later. Oryx pays us another visit. I'm the last hope of the light. I have taken entire worlds. You are not worthy to face me. We finally get to these two taken bosses, the Centurion and the Ogre, and this fight was pretty tough. But my trusty Red Death wasn't playing around either, so I had to beat the bricks out of him. I took the portal and grabbed a Calcified Fragment, one of 50 for the Touch of Malice exotic quest. Now it was time for the final fight. There's a reason this is so iconic. The way that the light goes down, it fades in, Oryx's wings, it's like watching an anime villain intro. It's just so cool. I even was inspired by this door when I made my merch. So if you go to evanf.store, you can see this intro for yourself. And hey, look, look, we have a Crota and Oryx designs just for you. Trust me, they are insane. Link down below. While the fight is cool, albeit it's a little too similar to the Shades of Oryx, but it also wouldn't be the end of Oryx either. Oryx fucking ascended, and Eris grabs a shard from the sword to kick off the exotic sword quest. The Taken King story concludes, or does it? See, this was different, and to say the story was over would be a lie, because not only are there seemingly infinite quests spread through the world, there's a whole catalog of exotic missions, and additions. Destiny's campaigns were notably the weakest portions of the game, and while the Taken King raised the stakes miles into the sky, 
I do still think that the story was the least interesting part. And after hyping it up so much, it should be taken as a compliment to the rest. Plus, the story really ends in the finale, King's Fall. So take another break, grab some more food and drinks like gamer subs using code EVAN, because we're jumping back in. We have gone through a lot of exotics on this channel, but a bunch of them are from this DLC. First of all, the quest tab was added here, and with it came 18 quests before we get to the class specific ones. Let's get those out of the way. Whether you were a hunter, warlock, or titan, you had a unique quest to your class that was legendary. Hunters, you got Steel Piercer, the best of the bunch, a sniper with a scope unique to it from the other legendary snipers but it could only be used while you were on Hunter. Titans, you got a Mobius, a legendary shotgun that wasn't the best, but it was cool. Warlocks, you got Susanu. Susanu? Sus? Which kind of sounds like Snoo Snoo as well. This was just a pretty basic fusion rifle. But I wasn't expecting the Taken King to deliver another step to each class weapon. You see, it wasn't just legendaries, it was exotics too. Once the gunsmith was rank 3, and you got the required amount of kills with each specific weapon, you could complete the quest, and were rewarded with your class weapon. Hunters, you got a familiar friend with Ace of Spades, a hand cannon with Firefly and the Maverick perk that made precision kills move one round from your ammo into the magazine. Make no mistake, this was not the top gun until Destiny 2. Titans, you got Fabian Strategy with the perk Frontlines to reload a portion of the mag with a kill and stabilize while you're shooting, making this a pretty decent option for general play. Warlocks, you got Slaylock, an exotic scout rifle that felt increasingly better as your super went up. Perfect for someone with self-res waiting to pop the super for the right moment. Again, the Taken King was loaded with content. We are talking 17 brand new exotic weapons and 10 improved year one exotics, each equipped with slight changes to the weapons, but mostly just level to be able to be acquired in the Taken King. These varied in long quests searching through the Dreadnought with Touch of Malice requiring 45 of 50 total calcified fragments and a completion of the King's Fall raid before even acquiring it. Speaking of those calcified fragments, they lended perfect to the hunt of every other part of the Taken King. Because Touch of Malice was so powerful, it made you want to do this quest, and Bungie scattered the fragments in different places that you'd be completing other parts of the Taken King for anyways. So you felt like exploring for many, many reasons. Secret Worm God chests each with their own puzzle to solve, like having to sword block to grab a chest, beating Court of Oryx bosses, some of the calcified fragments were even hidden in the raid, others were from backtracking through areas and taking hidden paths only your ghost could see. Speaking of that Court of Oryx, my god was this activity good, and I plan on making a video just about this one in particular. There were different tiers of boss fights, each with their own unique mechanics in a small room for random players to come together and take them down. Each boss had a calcified fragment with a tier 3 having a unique one as well on a weekly rotator. The new introductions was in the artifacts, a brand new item to go along with your build to increase stats like strength, intellect, and discipline. These didn't have any impact really other than that, but one of these was a wedding ring that Bungie made in honor of a player getting married to another player, so kudos for that. The Court of Oryx was special, and if you've seen my video on Escalation Protocol, just know EP was inspired by the Court of Oryx. The fragments weren't the only mysterious piece of fun to be had while exploring. There were Skyburner's keys from killing Cabal targets and then putting in security codes, began a three-step quest of killing and tracking down Cabal, finally with their leader. If you killed this leader, you could open up a chest full of engrams, materials, reputation, and a calcified fragment. See? These are everywhere. The other beefy exotic quest besides Touch of Malice was the Sword Exotic Quest. Each of the three swords had a lot of grind, and by the end of it, you were in a standoff with the Talking Knight from the cutscene with Oryx, Ekthar. I will always remember the way to access the area to fight him being unique, with you having to kill all three knights surrounding this door, in quick succession to open up the doors, and square off with a final showdown against Ekthar. 
and then the Dark Blade, which had extra bosses in the arena for the swords. Dark Drinker, Raised Lighter, and Bolt Caster. All new exotics, with swords being a new addition to the Taken King. Later on, Sleeper Simulant was added, with what was thought to be a much bigger quest in similar fashion to the Touch of Malice or Swords, but it was really just time-gated. At least the power fantasy was there, because Sleeper was the ultimate weapon in terms of damage, and most bosses. The other big boss killer, and one that would be very helpful in King's Fall, we're talking about the Black Spindle. Other than those exotics, there was one other secret type of exotic that just didn't hit the same way. And that was no time to explain. Refunding ammo from precision hits, but it just wasn't that powerful, even if it was a secret mission. The other exotics included Hereafter, The Last Note, Zalo Supercell, and for PlayStation only, the Jade Rabbit. But these were all just the RNG exotic weapons. The Taken King did introduce a way to get them and the improved year one exotics at a faster rate. And that was called a three of coin from Uncle Zer. These worked by consuming one and having a higher chance on boss kills to drop an exotic engram. Three of coin led to the RNG exotic game and core activities like PVP and strikes. The rest of the exotic weapons were acquired through various quests like Bully and Gemini from the Lost and Found quest, First Curse from the Gunsmith, and the Chaperone from a Crucible quest for Amanda Holiday. Guys, that was just the weapons. There is a lot more armor here. We're talking 20 new pieces of exotic armor. So I'm just gonna talk about the best and worst from each class. And if you want me to make a video on the exotic armor or forgotten exotics of Destiny, just let me know in the comments. Warlocks got, uh, you didn't get good stuff. I guess the impossible machines were the best part of the Warlock exotics here because they granted landfall without having to select it on the Stormcaller tree. The worst was Alchemist Rainman, the Warlock exotic chest that looked amazing, but only gave you additional glimmer on kills. Hunters. The best exotic was Graviton Forfeit, because it granted Shade Step, meaning that you didn't need to rock Shade Step on the subclass tree. It was naturally on this helmet. And Shade Step wasn't even a class ability. In fact, they didn't have those in Destiny 1. It was just a passive ability from crouching twice. The worst for Hunter is the Tarantella for regenerating Arc Super a little bit faster, but you could argue it was good for PvP. Titans had the best exotics of the bunch. Twilight Garrison was the top dog, giving an air dash for wearing the chest, very similar to what Warlocks have in Destiny 2 called Icarus Dash. Pushing Titan skating so far forward and adding so much movement that players still want it today. I guess the worst Titan exotic would be the Empyrean Bellicose, but it was still pretty decent. Outside of many, many exotic class items, grinding for the exotic armor just felt amazing. And popping three of coins with the buds, gaining reputation from killing bosses for new monarchy, dead orbit, or future war cult while earning the newly introduced strike specific loot in new and even old strikes. It just all blended so well and made the Taken King this magical experience. The Taken King also remixed older strikes into Taken versions to add a new spark of life to them. And it was a nice touch that reminded me of why I love Destiny strikes more than Destiny 2 strikes. On the PvP front, the Taken King introduced a full new variety of trials, weapons, and armor including some iconic staples. You know what? Rifle Gaming, take it away. It. What's a pop lob in here, too? Rifle Gaming here! <laughs> Doctrine of Passing was the best of the bunch, being a 900 RPM auto rifle and a part of every PvP loadout. Trials did have one major issue, though, and that was Sunbreaker Titans. I know we complain about stasis and the troubles it caused to Destiny 2, but Sunbreaker was stasis before stasis. The good news was that the eight PvP maps all made up for the absurdity that was Sunbreakers, and Bungie would nerf them somewhat fast. But when you heard that super pop, you knew it was time to hide. It can't be spoken about enough just how much the Taken King added in terms of quests exotics, incentivized loot, and variety for all players. This 
was peak Destiny 1 for a reason, and it would go quiet for only a little bit. Until... April 2016 was the final update to the Taken King, but before this came around, Bungie introduced the first holiday event with Festival of the Lost, a way to sink in some extra fun to get some Eververse items. Only one mask to my knowledge was for silver, and the rest could be earned through the candy bag quest for Ava Levante. Festival of the Lost has since become an every year event, losing some of its original charm. But in the Taken King, it was brand new and beautiful. Later into the year, Bungie would introduce an event for Christmas named Sparrow Racing League, a place to test out those brand new Sparrow horns and race against your friend like Mario Kart on two new tracks. I remember this event having the first of the record books that was only for silver, but I didn't mind buying it as the Taken King had so much bang for my buck already. This event had a bunch of records to punch in and a unique legendary helmet that was the only helmet in the entire game where you could instantly summon a Sparrow as the perk, making Sparrow flying tech a whole lot easier to pull off. Speaking of Sparrows and SRL, Bungie promoted the Taken King with a Red Bull Sparrow quest for anyone who could snag a code from a local shop to game. Now, I prefer gamer subs with code Evan because it's just a better deal. But Activision hit us with the Red Bull codes. If you put this in, you got a full Sparrow quest in the game with a really cool finale that was incredibly difficult. The reward being the second trick Sparrow in the game, making Sparrow flying again a whole lot easier. On the tracks, Sparrow Racing League was really fun, but it didn't offer enough arcadey fun or obstacles. It felt like the same race a lot of the time, and Bungie would add more in the following year of SRL, but this might have been the reason it never returned to Destiny 2. It just wasn't all that interesting. In February of 2016, Bungie introduced Crimson Days with Team Doubles from Halo debuting in Destiny. But with the Broken Heart modifier if a teammate goes down, making you gain bonus attributes in the mode. You fight in a round-based 2v2 game for armor and weapons, shaders, emblems, etc. And it was fantastic. Of course, Eververse had her hands in it, but Tess wasn't as intrusive back then, so I didn't mind spending money on this one either. Then, on April 11th, Bungie dropped a trailer for the April update to the Taken King. And I'm just going to let the trailer speak for a lot of this one. It was amazing. Live. Here the community's call for new content and with the April update, the live team is excited to be able to bring new ways to play and experience Destiny. Making your Guardian more powerful is a huge component to the Destiny experience. So with the April update, the live team raised the light level up to 335. We basically made it easier to increase your light level through different sources. So whatever you're interested in, there's something there for you. Crucible and Trials of Osiris and Iron Banner. Court of Orcs, King's Fall, Nightfall, and Prison of Elders, all roads lead to 335. <laughs> the strike-specific loot, the revamps to Prison of Elders, the update to the core, the understanding of what a Destiny player wanted in 2015 was unmatched, and the Taken King never stopped delivering. If you've watched this far into the video, you're either a massive fan of the Taken King, or you fell asleep. And in that case, wake up all right sorry about that the taken king was brilliant it was one of bungie's best dlcs ever made and debatably to a lot of people it is their best dlc for destiny which <laughs> it's kind of bittersweet right year two being the best year <laughs> that's the life of a destiny player what can i say the taken king was brilliant and the only criticism it ever gets is that it was so much at once that people get off the game after the buffet of content each holiday event kept us coming back there were two studios activision budget a massive delivery of a game way over expectations you can thank the taken king for changing everything about destiny and i am so happy to have finally gotten to talk about it in the following months 
a red swarm would appear above some players' heads with a hidden code pointing players to a place called Owl Sector. But that is for another video. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time. 9.3 out of 10 for the Taken King. Mmm.